yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer and he is in you and you need not be afraid. And now, how Lindsay's Bible study, the book of John. We're born out of God's power. In other words, the source of our new birth is faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and then the immediate, instantaneous, once and for all work of the power of God wherein he creates again in us his own life and gives us a spiritual nature that will now be able to understand him and be able to relate and grow to know him. You see, before you're born spiritually, there's no way you can really know God. You can know that he must exist. You can come to the knowledge that there must be a God. But you can't know him personally until you receive Christ and you're born again spiritually. We're born physically alive, but spiritually dead. Physically alive, but spiritually dead. And so, until that which was lost in the original sin is restored by the work of Christ and our faith in that work, we can't really know God. And so he shows that the world is divided into three categories. That's all God sees. As today are those who receive Jesus Christ and believe in what his name stands for. And they are instantaneously, once and for all, made members of God's family by a spiritual birth that puts them in the forever family. And I mean forever. Once you're born spiritually, that can't be reversed. Now God will, you say, well, what's going to keep people from sin? I've had some interesting conversations with some preachers who believe you can lose your salvation. And uh, I, after talking with them a while, I say, you know, what you're really saying is that unless you keep every Christian, you scare the hell out of them, they're going to sin all over the place. I said, let me tell you something. I have sinned trembling about what God's going to do to me, but it didn't stop me. Because that is not what stops you. It's depending on the power of the Holy Spirit and making the choice to say no to sin. God never removed that choice. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you say no to sin and then say, Lord, if you leave me to myself, I'll do it. Now I'm depending on the Holy Spirit. And he will give you the power as long as you make the choice to be good. But when you fail, there's the divine woodshed. I just simply label this verse the greatest miracle of all time. I don't believe there's any greater miracle than what is described in this verse. There are great miracles, but I don't believe there's any greater one than this. Now remember who the word is. Remember last week I told you, the word is a title, and it's, it, it's a title of the second person of the Godhead because logos means the concept, the, the mind behind a word. And so that is the title that is given to the second person of the Godhead where it says, in the beginning or absolutely, in the absolute beginning, there always was before that the Word. So we're talking about someone who is, has always existed without a beginning. 
And the word always was with God, face to face with God, in communion with him, always. Before any material existence, he was always face to face with God. And the word always was God. As to his essence, his being, his attributes, he is God. Through him all things came into being that have come into being. Now that's the one that he now describes in this incredible verse. He says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now here is what I believe the Greek says in its fuller sense. And so the word became a human being, the one who existed for, from forever past, became a human being and lived among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only one directly born from God the Father, full of grace and truth. And this full of grace and truth means the complete expression of God's grace and truth in himself. You know what it means here for the, this eternal second person to become a human being? And to actually live among us. He is the glory of God in heaven. The second person, as I told you last week, is the one through whom God always expresses himself outwardly. Whether it's by word communication, whether it's by a manifestation of himself, something that can be seen, or any way that he, any way that the Godhead reveals himself is always through the second person. That's why he's called the word, as I said last week, you only learn who I really am on the inside, you see my body, but that's not the real me. The real me is this invisible life that's inside. And I clothe my invisible self with my words. And that's how you know the real me or any other person. That's why he's called the word, because he is the outward expression of the invisible God. He's the one that always reveals God whatever way. When he, when he became a human being, just his being was an expression of God. Every movie made, every expression, every emotion he felt, every word he said, everything he did, it revealed God. And yet he became a human being. Now, it's hard to wrap your mind around what that really involves. How could this creator of the universe condescend to becoming one of us? How could he do that? Why did he do it? In order for him to be born so he could be a sinless man. He had to be born with a human mother. But God himself was his father. Why is he called the son of God? <laughs> because God's his father. Here is a man whose father was directly God. Now that will answer the Jehovah Witness when they come to the door, okay? They say, well, if he's the son of God, he had to have a beginning. 
Well, yeah, it's human nature had a beginning. Because God is the father of his human nature. But he could not be the father of the second person of the Godhead because he's co-eternal and co-equal. You follow me? Now, I'm, I'm giving you some very deep theology here. I hope you're understanding. Because I've seen a lot of guys in the theological seminary didn't follow it. So, the Son of God began when God begot a human son of a human mother. The second person the Godhead isn't, isn't the son. It's the human nature begotten through Mary. Now, do you believe me or not? Hold your, hold your place here, and I'll show you where it says that. Luke chapter 1, verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. For this reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. Now, what is called the Son of God? Only the holy offspring. See that? God is the direct father of the man, Jesus. So, God is his father in a way he's not father to any of us. Because he's directly the father of his human nature. Exciting, isn't it? So, next time a Job witness comes in with a story about, well, he's a God, because it doesn't, it says that he's not, there's no definite article in, in verse 1 of John 1 uh, before the word God. Remember, I told you in Greek, that doesn't mean that it means a, it simply draws attention to the essential essence of the noun if, a, if the definite article is left out. But this shows that the Son of God that had a beginning is the human being that God himself was father to with his mother, human mother Mary. Now, So he laid aside the use of his human nature. Now that's why the Apostle John does something that no other writer of the Gospels did. And I've said this before, I'm going to keep saying it because we're going to keep running into this all the way through the Gospel of John. Uh, the Gospel of John says over and over and over something that Jesus said that none of the other gospel writers picked up on because they didn't understand it. John did. John quotes Jesus as saying over and over again, the miracles I do, the signs that I do, I do not of myself, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. Now, you're going to find that in different ways all the way through the Gospel of John. That's why he said at the end of John's Gospel that he who keeps believing in me, the things that I do, shall he do also. And greater than these shall he do. Meaning, not greater in uh, worth, but greater in number. Because there will be more people with the Holy Spirit in them. He said he was going to the Father and he was going to send the Holy Spirit and therefore the things that those who keep believing in him, the things he did, will do also because the Holy Spirit dwells in us as he dwelt in the human nature of Jesus. And the one that keeps depending moment by moment on the Holy Spirit will find that all kinds of things will be produced in and through him by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to God's will. This doesn't mean you go out showing off all of the things that God can do through you. 
It'd be like jumping off the precipice that Satan challenged Jesus to jump off of to prove that the angels would bear him up lest he dash his foot against the stone. He said, you don't tempt the Lord. But as a man grows in the, in the uh, maturity and trusts the Lord and depends on the Holy Spirit, within whatever God's will is for your life, he will give you the power and through the spiritual gifts give you the ability to do whatever he has in store for you. And that's, but Jesus had all the gifts and the Holy Spirit dwelt in him and he kept saying, the things I'm doing, I do through the power of the Father who dwells in me. Now that's important for what reason? Because if Jesus ever did one thing by fudging and just using his own divine power, he wouldn't have been a true man. So he had to live exactly as we live, by faith, depending on the Holy Spirit. And as I said last week, and I think about this all the time, I think about the things that Jesus did and the things that happened to him and everything else. But especially, you know, the, we think the, the greatest suffering that Jesus had was hanging on the cross. Well, that was great suffering. But the greatest suffering was to hear the insults. Ha! If you're the Son of God, save yourself and us. Come down from the cross. His human nature was nailed a cross, but his divine nature that was part of him was holding the universe together and holding these people together so they could get the breath to curse him the next time. The greatest suffering was that he could have stopped that suffering any time he willed it. But if he had, there would be no salvation for anyone. He had to endure Every moment he was on this earth, the deprivations and, and the uh, short, shortcoming of power and everything else, just as we do, and not at any point use his divine power. One thing to suffer, not be able to do anything about it, you just bear it. But if you know you can do something about it at any moment, that's real suffering because... You've got to make, keep fighting not to make the choice to use your own power. Yeah, you had to. Every minute that he was on this earth. And he didn't die. He could have willed his death. He said, no man takes my life from me, John 10. I, t I have, I take it myself. I lay it down of myself. When he had fulfilled Every prophecy about the cross and the things that were supposed to happen to him, he finally said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died of his own will. But not until every last prophecy was fulfilled. And not until every sin had been paid. Then he said, paid in full. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He died. Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 9. But we do see him, Jesus, who, who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of, the de uh, suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for every one of us. You see, that's, this is all based upon what I've been saying. We see Jesus made lower than the angels. Made a man. Why? For the suffering of death in our place. That he, by the unmerited favor of God, tasted death for every one of us. In our place. It goes on to say, for it was fitting for him, 
for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, see, the uncreated creator, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, uh, those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call us brothers, saying, I will proclaim thy name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing thy praise. And then in verse 14, since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. For assuredly he does, does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham, and therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, you see, a human being in everything, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation means to, to uh, pay for sin by satisfying God's righteousness against our sin. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So don't ever think you're suffering something Jesus doesn't know about. He suffered in all things, as we do. Now one last thing in Hebrews chapter 1. For which of the angels did he ever say, and then he goes on through uh, things that show that things that were said to angels. And... Uh, in verse 6, and when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says. Now, the following is said to whom, according to that verse. When he brings the firstborn into the world, he says. Who is that? Jesus. All right. All right, now, look at what God says to Jesus. Quoting from the Old Testament. Who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son he says. Now underline that and don't ever forget it. To the Son he says. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Who is he saying that to? This is God the Father. Who is he saying that to? Jesus. And he calls him God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy companion. How many persons are called God in that verse? Two. Therefore, God... Jesus, thy God, the Father, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. And thou, Lord, now who is he spe still speaking to? The Son. And thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They will perish, but thou remainest. They will all become old as a garment. And as a mantle, thou wilt roll them up. As a garment, thy will also be changed. They will also be changed. And thy years will not come to an end. You know, the ultimate love, the second person, the Godhead, Jesus, Jesus our Lord, the ultimate love he showed us is that from the moment he was born as a human being, he became different than God the Spirit and God the Father forever. Did you know that? Because from that moment, the second person, in addition to being God, will always be 
a human being. He took a fundamental change to his person when he voluntarily became a human being. And that resurrected, glorified human being, Jesus our Lord, will always be one of us. From eternity past until the birth, he was the unapproachable second person of the Godhead creator. From that time, he became one of us. And forever, and forever, and forever, and forever, he will always be one. That's why he says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He is right now constantly interceding for every believer at the right hand of the Father. And he's never lost a case. He watches after us. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. You can find more of How Lindsay at his website, www.howlindsay.com. There you can access our video and article archives. Visit our online store for How Lindsay CDs, books, and other specialty items. Hal Lindsey is pleased to present his first ever audiobook, Faith for Earth's Final Hour, read in its entirety by Joel Weldon, professional voiceover artist. Recognizing the truth of Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. This audiobook is now available for purchase in three formats a 9 CD set for $44.99 plus shipping and handling, a USB flash drive for $44.99 plus shipping and handling, or as an audio download from HalLindsay.com for $24.99. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to How Lindsay Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.